How is it possible that you go into a relationship and the next moment he says to you, and there's a stolen identity, stolen photos, everything is false. It's not that man. And then he says, yeah, but you know what? He's got a bit of a financial problem. He needs a bit of assistance with this, that, and the other. And eventually they spend millions. The biggest case I have on a sweetheart scam is 15.4 million rand that was paid over five years. And it's on wow. our project. That is, you, you, you cannot fathom it. You cannot believe it. That actually sounds too good to be true, but it's facts. So you never give money unless you do a thorough investigation ever. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today, we have with us the strong personality, Mike Borlais. Mike Borlais is the sole pr proprietor of specialized security services with over 35 years of experience. So he's quite the guru. Mike, thank you for your time. Welcome to the show. Cheers. Thanks for the opportunity. Mike, I'm fascinated with you and I'd like to hear more about who is Mike Borlase and how did Mike Borlase become Mike Borlase? Um, <clears throat> it would be best, I'll give a bit of detail, but it would be best to follow us on Facebook and to see what we do. Uh, there is um, enough information that explains uh, the kind of work that we do, which is um, serious, violent, serious economic crimes. But um, I would say it all started when I was about 17, 16 or 17 years old. I interfered in a fight uh, in the midtown of Pretoria where some of the girls were attacked uh, in my school when we were on an outing and I interfered and I sorted the matter, actually did it quite well. And um, that gave me a bit of a, uh, it, it was always in my nature to interfere. Where uh, when there was something wrong in nature, nature, I would do something about it. I would interfere. I would not consider uh, in those younger years, uh, should I do this or not? I would automatically interfere and try and sort the matter. <clears throat> so uh, in that situation, it was uh, one of the few and first times in my younger years where humans were involved. And um, I saw that I could make that difference. And that just became the trend. I got all the more involved in assisting people, eventually ending up uh, doing the bouncing in, in Pretoria and Johannesburg. Um, that escalated into uh, specialized security services, doing investigations into serious violent and serious economic crimes. And uh, as you have said, there were close to 40 years of experience uh, in, in dealing with this kind of crime. Uh, dealing with the worst of the worst and all cases from assisting an old lady uh, that her cat is in the tree or um, to the worst of the worst murders this country can offer. So everything and anything in between, we don't say no. We always are ready, willing and able to assist in order to make that difference. Uh, we are the end of the line, so we are mostly known for uh, the go-to guys when all else fails, but uh, we never say a no to any request, even if it's a fresh request, a new case, uh, obviously cold cases, um, and obviously cases that uh, nobody else could have solved, they would eventually come to us and ask us for a final investigation in order to get closure. And Mike, how many people work for your organization? So I have about 50 number ones and about 300 affiliations. Affiliations basically are uh, other specialist operatives that we will draw or pull in if necessary when there are um, cases that we have received where we need extra hands. But the 50 number ones are uh, uh, investigators that gets the cases that we get on a daily basis. And some of these investigators would have 
up to three, four hundred cases that they monitor or uh, uh, service. I have a cybercrime unit uh, consisting of about five specialist operatives, whom they also have affiliates with those in the uh, industry that can assist them. I have a forensic unit, it's the same. I have a serious violent crime unit, I have a serious economic crime unit. Those are the two biggest units. And um, under those units, you get uh, certain um, uh, other units like uh, serious uh, economic unit would have uh, Ponzi schemes, knocks and scams, which goes hand in hand with the cybercrime unit, uh, fraud, theft, misrepresentation, anything that's got to do with money from the smallest to uh, debt collection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to the biggest uh, corruption uh, contract hijacking. Um, as I've said, uh, Ponzi schemes um, uh, and any and other economic um, institution that needs to be investigated. Uh, if there is a complaint, that kind of investigations. And then on the violent crime, we have a unit that specifically deals with uh, crimes against women. Uh, well, let me say we've got a, the way we say it, crimes against children, women and the elderly. So that unit is quite busy. Then we have a unit that deals specifically with certain sexual crimes. And then we have a unit that deals with the serious violent crimes like um, uh, aggravated car hijacking, cash in transits, aggravated robberies, uh, farm attacks, murders, um, uh, sexual crimes, uh, rapes, and child molestation. So all the, uh, we call it the blood spatter cases where there's blood involved and where it's aggravated and serious. There's several units that deals with that. I have a task team that obviously also operate nationwide. So if there's a situation in any place um, in South Africa, I would send a task team to deal with that. And they would then in that area pull in other investigators or the police that we operate with. Wow. So it's quite a massive organization. Mike, um, what is behind all the kidnappings in South Africa recently? Because it seems there's quite, it's been a, quite a spike, and uh, especially in a place like the Western Cape. Have you had to handle uh, kidnappings and what's behind this? Yeah, kidnappings is uh, one of the uh, uh, most, most heinous and horrendous crimes in South Africa. And unfortunately, it's escalating because crime begets crime. When a crime works in South Africa, then uh, <clears throat> it will escalate. Um, a small example, if there's a neighborhood that has a house robbery and it's not dealt with immediately, then the possibility of other house robbery, robberies being committed in that area is, is, is much greater. You need to deal with crime worldwide on a zero tolerance basis. And if you don't, crime begets crime, it escalates. So kidnappings is um, one of the most difficult cases to, to handle because especially on the high level uh, kid, uh, kidnapping platforms, these guys are oiled machines, uh, oiled criminals. They know exactly what to do. They plan it very well. Um, there is months of surveillance. They get all the information of those that they're going to kidnap. So um, by the time they commit the kidnapping, they leave no information behind, no forensic evidence. There's no cameras. There's no possibility of cell phone track and tracings. There's, there's literally nothing left. And um, you have to rely on mistakes that they make afterwards. And uh, on that platform, on that high level of kidnapping, it's usually extreme businessmen that are very, very rich that they have identified. As I've said, they know everything of them, absolutely everything from what they wear, where they walk, uh, what they believe in, who they're involved with, how much money they have. Everybody in the family, they know there's nothing they don't know. They take their time. It's a syndicate, and it usually consists of um, sometime um, transatlantic uh, specialists that uh, is given the instruction as to do the kidnapping and uh, gives the funding. And then there's a middleman that would um, 
recruit a group in South Africa. And it would be usually amongst um, those that they've used before. And it's, it's a word of mouth situation. It's in the underworld. So the heads that are many a times overseas are never identified because if caught, it's usually just the, if you can call it the task team that have been given the instructions to commit the kidnapping. But that's on the high level. But you get many levels of kidnapping in South Africa. You know, somebody can owe a drug lord some money and then the drug traffickers will hold him. They will just blatantly take him, hold him, get the parents on the phone and say, you will pay this, this, that, or the other. Otherwise, we're going to cut one of his fingers or we're going to come to your house. So uh, that's a form of kidnapping. Then there, there's a kidnapping of... Um, which is also spiked in South Africa of um, where people will just go to a mall, elderly people, they buy their groceries and they'll um, await them in and grab them, put them in the car, drive with the elderly, uh, empty their bank accounts, take the groceries. I mean, <clears throat> you can't believe it. The levels of kidnappings there are in South Africa. And then there's another form of kidnapping that is seen as a kidnapping is where parents don't return their children. Uh, in a divorce case. Um, so in other words, the husband has the kids for the weekend, but he um, doesn't return them on time. Then the wife, uh, the ex-wife has the right to open up a case of kidnapping. If she, for instance, has no communication uh, and they un unfortunately abuse that because they wouldn't even try. They would just create as much problems as possible for the other spouse if they can, we see this a lot and um, it's actually um, unacceptable because kidnapping is something that you would, uh, you have to uh, do a proper identification, evaluation, investigation uh, before you say it's a kidnapping. But unfortunately in South Africa, husbands, wives, ex-husbands, ex-wives, they just open up kidnapping cases left, right and center. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's not a good idea and we warn against this. But you have m many levels of kidnapping and the main mm. uh, act for kidnapping is to have something of extreme value would be a human in order to get what you want, either information or money. Mm. And is there also scenarios, for example, the Taken movie scenario where women are kidnapped and they end up being the prostitute for a Saudi prince in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, that's more into, um, um, it holds hand, hands with the other crime, um, um, uh, sex trafficking. And uh, um, the sex trade in South Africa is, is big. So what happens there is they would bring in women from overseas, from the Ukraine, for instance. Many people are trying to leave the Ukraine, but this has been happening for years. And these women are promised the stars and the moon in South Africa, but when they are here, they're actually exploited. Their, port, their passports, all their documentation is kept. They also are con constantly controlled and monitored, so they cannot just freely communicate. They're in a new country. They don't know the law here. They don't know the authorities, but they are very quickly extremely intimidated and extremely manipulated and they live in constant fear. And then it's said to them that if they were to do this, that, and the other, uh, prostitution, um, drug muling, uh, and other crimes, um, because they get involved in sextortion as well, and extortion. Uh, and if they don't do that and bring that kind of money in, then they won't, will never be citizens in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that started many, many years ago in the years of Lolly Jackson when he was still alive. And um, it has escalated to a point where these people are extremely exploited, sometimes with children as well. And sometimes uh, women and children from South Africa exported outside. This is an industry where there's not a lot of information because it's very, very tight-lipped and there's very little information. And it's seldom that information leaks out. So human trafficking is a problem. It's a worldwide problem, but it's probably the crime with the least information possible because of the extreme um, vastness of this, this extreme danger. 
And this is also the group of criminals that would not think twice, um, making you as a woman or a child disappear. And, so, uh, Mike, isn't it also perhaps that it, it goes high up? It's some governments or very powerful organizations involved in, in kidnappings. Any crime um, that's doing well and where the criminal gets away with it, especially when it's groups and syndicates and gangs and mafiosos, has some form of police involvement or government involvement. Crime can only flourish when there's an authority involved. Otherwise, it can't. So when the police are involved, government, municipalities uh, are involved, you, you will get this kind of um, a syndicates gangsterism that is extremely successful because they've got their tentacles in everywhere and they know how to manipulate and pay for everything. Also take in consideration all these groups are extremely powerful financially and they are have backing by the best of the best um, support by other authorities and those in the judicial system, as well as lawyers and advocates. So it's not something that um, um, that is easily identified because each one has a hold on the other and there is a rule of engagement. If you fuck up, you die. And it is clearly demonstrated. And it's clearly acted out in order to send that message. But this is not only in human trafficking. You get this in drug trafficking as well, but not as big as, as that. And you also get it in kidnapping. So those three, when it's got to do where you have got a human in your position, the best way to let all other humans know is uh, that, that you don't take nonsense and that you are operating on your rules and regulations on a zero tolerance basis. In other words, if you fuck up, you die, is by setting an example by murdering or, or maiming those people. Um, Mike, sort of an unrelated note, I recently watched an interview with a criminologist and he says that walls and gates actually help criminals if they want to break into your house because they can hide behind walls. Is that true? You, is there a higher likelihood of someone breaking into your house if you have a wall surrounding your house? Look, um, in, uh, the best answer on who says what and what is the best suggestion for safety and security of your property can only be ascertained if you do a proper risk analysis in your area. If your area is all and completely walled and there's no crimes, then you do. If your area is completely walled and everywhere, but they've used that as a hiding place and then get over, or they hijack you at your gate and then come in. You know, we've heard of the, the most incredible ways they get into your premises. And that's why I say there's actually no real answer. You can go out of your way um, with uh, trigger lights, with beams, with uh, security equipment, even with guards, bodyguards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, uh, the bottom line is, depending what your worth is, the criminal will take the necessary steps and escalate his behavior. So one of the interesting things that we've heard is they would go as far as taking a refuse black bag and pull it up over themselves and then just lay a couple of black bags close to your gate on the front of your lawn or the neighbor's lawn as if it's refuse that's being put wow. out. And then when the vehicle pulls up at the gate, voila, they jump out. So there are many ways and means. But they could also follow you. And when you're in the gate, they just uh, get you from behind. So a wall is a deterrent for a specific uh, criminal. Uh, a beam is a deterrent for a specific level of crime that would be committed. But those that identify you as rich and that you have gold and diamonds and um, you're an easy target, they'll do a bit of more planning and they will get in. So... My advice has always been in South Africa uh, not to splash who you are and what you have. Don't be a Kardashian and walk around with the most expensive watches and jewelry and all that shit. 
because you just draw attention. And that's at malls as well, because there are many um, those that scout at the malls and have a look around and see what you are wearing. And according to your, and it's unfortunately so, what must I say? I, I will not lie about this. This is the cases we deal with. And they will see if you've got expensive jewelry, an expensive car, expensive everything, that's a target that will move that criminal to take the extra risk in order to get you for some time in order to get what you have. So you must see it as the criminal walking around and seeing obviously what is about and what is the easiest target. Yes, so there's a lot of things that can deter it. But if there's information of your worth, it goes to a different level. And then they will go out of their way in order to get that. So my advice at the end of this is that please don't uh, go on social media and show everybody how many cars you have and what you uh, have in the bank and uh, all your jewelry and all your holiday trips. Stay away from social media. Social media is extremely dangerous. Uh, nowadays, it's easy to get your information. It's easy to, to if you've got a bit of a knowledgeable cybercrime criminal to hack your information. Uh, people are extremely careless on Facebook and on WhatsApp and on, on their cell phones. And actually, all they have to do is grab your handbag and then we got your cell phone. And if they got your cell phone and you shit yourself, you know you've got too much stuff on your phone. So in other words, you should only have on your phone numbers and communication stuff. Now, I know it's difficult to hear this because you've got businesses, you've got online banking, you do this, you've got groups, you've got church groups, you've got, you've got everything. But the point is the criminal will take your cell phone. You can have many passwords. You can have it off and he will take it to one of the joints where they will open it. They will get that information. And once they have that information, they can extort you, sextort you. They can have all your information and plan a serious attack. The main aim for any criminal syndicate before they act on any kidnappings, on any cash in transits, on any serious economic or even a serious violent crime, if it's a hit, is to get the social media information. If I have your information, I have power. The most valuable item, the greatest love affair on earth is man and his cell phone. Humans have, if, if I have a person's cell phone, I can tell you now, I know what he believes, what he votes for, what is his opinion about color, ethnic groups, uh, the police, uh, who does he love? Uh, has he got a girlfriend? Uh, everything about his children, his holidays, his most probably all the codes to his, his gates and banks and what have you. It's all kept on a phone. People put everything in their phone. And, and so much so that the phone is such a valuable item to us that if we get to a crime scene and there's several heaps of information and there's a cell phone, we will always go for the cell phone first because it even has your DNA in it because of the saliva and it has got your fingerprints on it. So the cell phone is the most important thing to us as authorities to, to fight and to identify crime, but it's also the most important thing to the criminal in order to gain information to commit the crime against you. Interesting. And uh, Mike, what is the success rate of your organization? What, what's, for example, a recent case that you successfully handled? The, <clears throat> not all, but most of the cases that uh, we handle um, are successful and we place them on Facebook, some of them. So maybe a missing person, we will state uh, on our Facebook, we've got projects that's got names and the project will read success project or project success. And then it will give the information of the project. So it's usually with missing persons or with... Um, a murder that was solved or um, uh, a big case. But um, you cannot place all success cases because people prefer their information to be confidential. Let me give you an example. Um, if a situation is solved in a marriage case that we investigate and things are sorted, you cannot send out a project and say, 
project success marriage solved and then you put the details there uh, people don't want the information the same with sex extortion the same with extortion people don't want the information out there saying that hey i've been extorted of millions and you know what mike bullace's organization sorted it um they don't want to be known that they've been extorted people don't want to know uh, or to uh, uh, the the complainants don't want their cases necessarily be uh, flaunted out there as a success project in order to first of all to uh, to uh, uh, teach people out there how these cases work and also leave them informed behind because they themselves put them out there as the stupid as the ignorant as the uh, person that this crime has been committed against and they might be then uh, embarrassed about it and, and, he, and he might uh, be extorted again no, after no, that. No. well well i can tell you um the chances of people being re-extorted once we have dealt with them and even those to those listening today after we'll probably after this have a bit of uh, talk on, uh, on cyber crime uh, will be extra careful and the chances of them being extorted will be very slim so out of all the thousands, which is the most cases we receive on cybercrime, um, maybe 10 or 20 in the last 10 years have recommitted a, um, or re, uh, got uh, uh, caught again in an extortion for a second time. But very seldom happens because extortion is a, is a serious, when we deal with it, it's a very serious uh, issue because we teach them, we spend time. And we warn them and we actually threaten our clients that if they do this again, that we would not help them or assist them. But anyway, it is important to, in all our crimes uh, that we investigate, to give a, a thorough uh, identification, evaluation, uh, investigation, risk analysis, expose to the complainants so that they know exactly what it entails how this is going to be handled and that they don't get involved in this again. So uh, uh, all our cases, you can say, is basically successfully um, handled, but you don't sometimes get the, if you've lost money and those that have stolen from you or committed fraud against you or extorted you or something that has gone wrong in which other way, sometimes that just cannot be fixed, but it doesn't mean it wasn't properly investigated. And it doesn't mean it wasn't properly identified and explained. So unfortunately, many a times people lose money. It's not retrieved. Many a times people cannot get things solved like a marriage. And many a times people are extorted in that money or any other crime that has been committed against them, whether it's a murder then or child molestation or of the worst of the worst. You, you can only do so much afterwards, but it doesn't mean that there hasn't been success. We believe in reintegration. So it, to us, it's not a matter of we get a case and just do a part. When we involve, we want to be solely and totally in control. We work with the authorities and we will work with those that assist us. But we are in control and we take it from the beginning to the end to reintegration in society. It's no use you just do part of the investigation and you don't teach the people and then you don't assist them back into society as more learned, more uh, knowledgeable and uh, in a position where they can make informed decisions. Because otherwise they will be back within a year with the same or other crimes being committed against them. So we take it from the beginning in complete control with those who assist right back to, into society, better, stronger, safer human beings. Interesting. That's a, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's a fascinating approach. And Mike, um, so, so cybercrime, is that one of the biggest fields that you, that your organization focuses on? And what's the latest trends in regards to cybercrime? Uh, cybercrime is the uh, biggest crime in the world. There is no bigger crime than cybercrime. That I can assure you. So um, if you look at the, the crimes in the world, um, cybercrime is the worst. Um, there's no solution for it. You can deal with it, but most of all cybercrime committed 
the monies for whatever damage was done through the cyber criminals is irreversible. So that's the shocking thing of cyber crime. It is the crime of the future. It is the biggest crime in the world. And it's the most difficult crime to investigate and has got the least of all crimes uh, of success. The success lies in having that person not getting involved again. Because remember, uh, humans like to, people like to explore. They become greedy. They become interested. And they get involved. And they, it's like a zeitgeist. It's like a spirit that gets hold of them and they have this hope and they think they can and they push it through. But actually in the back of their mind, they know that they shouldn't get involved. So cyber crime, the problem with, 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 with humans, with people is they get interested. They see something, they get interested, they become greedy. And uh, they fall for beautiful photos, uh, big amounts, uh, wonderful stories. I mean, if I can just get people to just read things thoroughly, just thoroughly, and come to the conclusion that when something sounds to be good to be true, it usually is. Just that. We'll say 50% of all the people getting involved in cybercrime. Secondly, if I can get them, if they still want to, and they are not steers in the skirach and they want to just, they want to really go for this. If I can just get them to just do a second investigation, a risk analysis, or a proper identification, or a proper evaluation, or an, <clears throat> a uh, call a friend, or ask your bookkeeper, or your attorney, or ask somebody in authority. Just a second right. opinion. Yeah. If, if I can just get those three things in people's lives, cybercrime will fall out completely. There won't be cybercrime. But people fall for holiday scams, for beautiful girls. Then it's not girls, it's syndicates. For beautiful cars, for cheap cars, for this, that, and the other. Cybercrime is enormous. It just, it is. There is a, actually there's no word to describe how big it is and how many people fall for it. And remember, cybercrime is not big amounts or big holidays or big cars or big this. It is part of it. They can extort you with a small amount, start with a small amount, and then it grows bigger and bigger, like the sweetheart scams. Um, the people that commit uh, these extortions and sextortions and all of this stuff, what they do is they, it's like fishing. They throw out so many lines into this dam of people. And if just a few bites a day, and they can just get, say, two, three thousand rand a day from a person, you can, you can do the sums and you can see what amount they make. But they themselves also get greedy, but they get always people that bite and get involved because they do, don't do those investigations. So just to reiterate, you never, ever give money unless you have thoroughly done a few things. Number one, you need to do a thorough evaluation. If something sounds to be good to be true, it usually is. That's where you stop, you walk away. Number two, if you're then still interested and you consider the possibility that you might get involved, you do a thorough risk analysis. You do a thorough investigation. You call a friend. You get authorities involved. You get knowledgeable people involved, those who know. You go to the know-to guy. Worst case scenario, you can always obviously email or call us. But you never give money unless you've done a thorough investigation, which includes all of that. And that includes in a relationship. I mean, just think for yourself, ladies. How many of you might be watching this? And I've had this talk. And this kind of talk on how many TV stations, on all my projects, on all the TV shows that we've been involved. How many times have I warned you? If a man says he loves you, he's supposed to give you money, not you him. How is it possible that you go into a relationship and the next moment he says to you, 
and there's a stolen identity, stolen photos, everything is false. It's not that man. And then he says, yeah, but you know what? He's got a bit of a financial problem. He needs a bit of assistance with this, that, and the other. And eventually they spend millions. The biggest case I have on a sweetheart scam is 15.4 million rand that was paid over five years. And it's on wow. our project. That is, you, you, you cannot fathom it. You cannot believe it. That actually sounds too good to be true, but it's facts. So you never give money unless you do a thorough investigation ever. I mean, just another example. When they send you these emails and these WhatsApps and say, they will loan you 200,000 rand, but you must, you know, give a small administration fee of 2,000 rand. People pay that. And then they come back and say, you know what? Uh, there must be some verification done. It's an extra five. Eventually, I have had people that have paid for 500,000 rand to get 200,000. I've had one lady that paid 7.2 million also on the project where she received then many years ago a SMS that said that she's won 99,000 rand and she paid 7.2 million. Now, do you believe that? Well, there's the project on Facebook. Read it. This is what people do. And I have to explain, people get involved in these things, not only because they are Neskirach interested and wow, and I can, and, and, and they also think they are being loved and cared for. And they've identified me, me. Hey, this is me. They're contacting me. I feel special. And unfortunately, these people fall because they seek and, and get into love relationships in all the wrong places and with the wrong people. You can never get involved in any relationship unless it's a correct relationship where you are evaluated as you're worth, who you are, what you are, and you are cared for properly and truly without them trying to get or a person getting money from you. And Mike, um, is this mostly a cybercrime? Is it mostly um, financially related or do people's identity also get stolen? Like their Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts? What, what's the mo Is it mostly financial or is there um, the identity situation as well? Cybercrime cannot be affected, uh, effective unless it's completely false. It's false information that's presented to you. In other words, let me use a very clear example. Um, there's this beautiful holiday photos. It doesn't exist, those photos were stolen. It's this beautiful car that is 200,000 rand cheaper. It's not their car, it's another car's photo. It can be a driver that has just taken a photo of a vehicle that passed by. That's what they do. It could be the identity theft of a organization. We've had so many vehicle uh, scams, it's unbelievable where legitimate organizations' information has been used. This scam, tax offices, banks, SARS, all of those documents have been forged. My information has been stolen. Not once, many a times, where people were moved to get involved with the me, which is not me. People have been threatened extremely intimidated, extorted, money's paid, because they were the imp under the impression it was me. The one was so bad that a family has paid, I think, two, 300,000 rand because they thought that one of my children was dead and I lost a leg. You, you cannot believe these things. It's all on the project. It's all in the, uh, the Bole series on TV. You can see it. So um, cybercrime is a complete false um, uh, based on everything that's false. It also relies on identity theft. It steals any and other and whatever identities and information they can in order to move you to get involved, whether it's a well-known name or whether it's a well-known brand or whether it's an authority or an institution, even the police. Some of our biggest cases are police impersonators, SAPS impersonators, SAPS corrupt cops. Go read it on, on our Facebook, the project. It is it is horrific 
it is it is actually shocking if you read it you you would not think that that is possible it's on the on the project so um it's become an international dilemma of of people just having false information presenting it to the public throwing out 10 or 20 lines catching people with that information extorting them from the smallest amounts to the biggest amounts mike um what is what is behind your dust up with Isaac de Plessis from Nisport? What is the story there? The story I I I do need is Skinner and Cockprot. So I don't believe in and I, I will never believe. There's certain things that uh, and I use the word believe because when you say believe, you actually stand by that credo and that statement. I believe in God, and that's a fact. I serve God and I try and serve. Uh, God as he requires of me according to the Bible, the Bible as we know it. I believe in the Bible. Uh, my crew and everybody working for me is of the same belief as me. Uh, we don't believe in anything that harms the body, so we stay away and we haven't been involved in smoking, we don't do drugs, we don't drink, and if there's an occasion, it is all controlled. So we've got belief systems that we live according to. When it comes to the public, <clears throat> we try and nowadays not only convince, but to teach, to actually teach the public to be responsible on social media. And if you're not, they must understand that there's consequences. Now, we, in the last year, we've, uh, last year and a half, at a stage, there was a, a first just one or two people which created a group which spread like a felt fire, which we've left to do so that we can see how big can a Skinner story, a rumor, a gossip, how quickly can fake news grow? So what we've done is we've done a project where we as an organization decided last year, I think it was April, uh, after a specific case, we left these uh, couple of people and see they started groups like Police Must Fall or, uh, uh, you know, uh, stupid names of groups uh, trying to belittle me, defame me, et cetera, et cetera. What would happen? And it was interesting to see that um, it's not necessarily the people that believe it that would join those groups, but it's people that is interesting, interested in seeing because you're well known, they know the kind of work that we do, and they just follow us. So say, for instance, we had say 50,000 people that got involved, you would have say 20 or 40 that would have had real problems with you and gripes, meaning real problems from their side. They were under the impression or they were under, uh, the, uh, uh, under the perception that we have done them in or neglected them or didn't do the work or took their money and didn't give a service, et cetera, et cetera. And then they blew it up and put it in the public domain and so forth. And then the rest, the uh, 49,660, uh, uh, nine, the rest of the followers uh, are people just interested. They get up because they've heard my callers. You know, if, if we go on TV or if we're in the news, everybody would like to know what's going on because um, the public in South Africa wants to know what are we involved with, what are we doing, and they also know that we'll say what we mean and mean what we say, and we'll identify it exactly as it is, because we don't say no comment. We will give an answer. So if there's something going on, we, they know we'll say it as it is. But the South African population, unfortunately, has fallen into a what I would call a... Um, it's worse than drugs. They are so gripped in social media. They just cannot wait. They don't think before they send or resend. They they just whatever comes in just goes out and add. They do the devil's algebra. They just they just throw it out there and they inconsiderate, irresponsible, and immature. And we've decided in this year, let's just check what does the South African public do. And it's a hell of a project, maybe a podcast uh, on its own at a stage because I'm prepared to do this because this to me is one of my biggest missions is to get people to be responsible with their mouths 
and their eyes and their ears, actually. We always say to our children, yeah, we don't want you to see this, you're too young. Or we don't want you to take this in, it's going to influence you, etc., etc. But you know what? It's the same for mature people. The people just want to see everything, hear anything, and say anything, go where they want to, say what they want to. They become absolutely lawless, disrespectful, etc., etc. And we saw that on those WhatsApp groups. And at a stage, we decided this is it. We've seen what we needed to see. And we started acting and we got all the necessary um, interdicts and uh, police cases in place because we wanted to also prove once we do this, how does the authorities uh, can be included and how can we teach this nation uh, in South Africa that if you say something, you must remember, you can be held accountable for it. And of late, in the last year and a half, you would see even the government has come many a times. Uh, we work very closely with the police. So many a times we would send out a project about fake news, especially fake news about the police. Not everything the government does is corrupt. You understand? But the South African like to say, yeah, yeah, you have done nothing. The government has done nothing. Or the government has done everything wrong. Or the police has done everything wrong. They have forgotten what the word nothing and everything means. So we're trying to teach people, when you say something, think in context, not just in yes information or assumptions. Because that's the mother of all fuck-ups. And if you got news or information before you send it, is it to your advantage? Is it absolutely to your advantage? Is it to the advantage of your family and friends, your neighbors? Is it to the advantage of the community, to your country? Is it advantage to everybody? And does it fall in the bracket of factual? If it's not factual, you cannot resend it. Unless you say, this is information, I'm unsure, can somebody assist me? Or this is information, it is fake news, or it's an assumption, or it's a yes, I don't forward it. But you can, you can check what does the South African people do. And it is our biggest problem in our country. And it's the problem that causes much more crimes and problems to people than actually all the other crimes that I've mentioned. Because if you can be influenced, which you are, and everybody is, by social media, you could buy the wrong medicine. You can go the wrong, uh, get involved with the wrong crowd. You can get involved with, a, with dark web and you can hire a hitman. You can get involved in the worst of the worst things and make the worst of the worst decisions, which eventually end up in the chain of events in your life that hurt so many people and yourself up to date. Just think about that for a moment. Now, look at all the fake news and information about the Ukraine, about what has been going on, on on the COVID stand, what has been going on in America, just those three subjects. And we all sit there and we think to ourselves, shit, just look at all this information. And then a week later, you hear that that what's been put there was fake. It was stuff that was so many years old. Or this what was said about this president isn't in effect so. And this was this what was said about COVID or this or that isn't in effect so. I have got such a strict rule in my groups that I don't allow a top um, issue to be discussed because the people get involved too much. They become emotional. They make emotional decisions. They make wrong decisions. I put it aside and I would say on the group, this topic is not to be discussed. We will do a thorough investigation and do one placement or a project and that's it. And I believe, I believe, if you don't know something, you say so. And then you don't proceed with it or send it out. You only send out stuff that you know, believe, and know for a fact is a fact. Otherwise, it is tainted. It's devil's algebra. It is fake news. And if it hurts you and your family and everybody else, you don't send it. Even if you so much and so like to send it, you just don't. So Isaac is um, a person of interest to us because we have warned him since last year that we will take drastic steps if he keeps on uh, promoting false news about us, where he himself admitted that he knows these people are lying through their teeth, but he made the statement to me directly. But Mike, the people love it, sir. This is what they want to see and it gives me numbers. 
Now, when he said that, that's where we made the decision to deal with him. And unfortunately, he was arrogant. He's not anymore. He has apologized. He has put everything right. And according to me, we are on a good page and we will stay uh, um, uh, knowing each other, etc. I won't cut him off. I'll be available for him and I'm sure he'll be available for me. But he himself has also said that he should have taken this seriously. And he has absolutely followed all the rules and regulations and he has cleared and removed everything. We have done this with several others and there's still a few that we're going to deal with. In the meantime, the government has been looking at this and the authorities, because they have also slowly but certainly come on board and also stating that there will be serious fines and jail time for sextortionists, for false news, fake news. Those recently I saw an a, a, a article by the government stating that there will be a bill passed of if you, um, if you defame the government or the authorities. These are all things that we need to get in place. But here's my biggest concern. Unless Facebook, WhatsApp, and all those that makes millions out of us through social media, they themselves don't take responsibility. This will never change. And let me shock you and everybody else then. Facebook, WhatsApp, and all these social media, every Twitter, Telegram, all of them, have the ability to program their systems in such a way that if they pick up certain things, even the tone of your voice, if it's a voice note, even a picture, if it's uh, dangerous, for pornography, even if it's wording like uh, killing or sabotage or what, 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 they have a way that can burn it. In other ways, that phone can be identified and that can be taken off. But they won't do that because they... And this is a very big problem we have, and it's a very serious discussion. They will lose millions because people will then go in a form of dark web form of communication mm. where that kind of control that, that's in place could not be affected. Mike, Humans won't. We're, we're, we're running out of they time. Won't. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah, that, that, that's important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just quickly, all these allegations, for example, that these people have purported that you've now taken care of, like um, that you've been charged for fraud, that you've been arrested, all of this is untrue. Untrue. Even the newspapers corrected that. Okay. The, the newspaper, and uh, it's all on our Facebook, the newspaper, uh, and I have respect for them because I have the best of the best relationship with the newspapers. Um, I believe... Uh, that newspapers can make the biggest difference in the world. If they are informed, the public can be informed. So I have a very good re relationship with the media, uh, the best of the best. They always call us. They always check up something uh, uh, from our side uh, if it's in effect. So if they want to do write the story, they believe what we say and they know that what we give is factual. And... Um, we had uh, an incident with a very, very well-known newspaper that placed uh, uh, a statement that I was arrested last year, December, because they were given wrong information. And uh, we have dealt with them and they've uh, rectified it and all is good. That was the only one. So other, all our newspaper clippings, all everything is on, on Google, on, on YouTube, on our Facebook, everything, wherever we've been in the media has always been placed as is. If I've made a mistake, I once made a very serious mistake in wording, I've apologized. Because mm. in our work, especially when you work with sextortion, I deal with extreme criminals. And the uh, incorrect wording was flying left, right and center. And this got uh, into the ears of some of the people that we dealt with on uh, the TV series that we were doing. Uh, but I had to take a back seat here and say, uh, I cannot just say, yeah, it's because of my work. I had take, took responsibility and said that even if I'm how upset and fighting a criminal, I must be careful of my wording. Mm. And uh, I accepted that responsibility and I apologized on national TV and, and everywhere. And I actually made it a subject uh, of extreme importance that you can be how, accept, uh, how upset, you must be careful what you say. Mm. You know, we easily say, uh, 
you upset me so much, I will kill you. But because we have lost the um, value of wording, like I've earlier said, on, this made me aware that we are saying things because it's the norm, but we don't really realize what the word means, like you've done nothing or everything. Uh, you must be careful. Uh, when you say something, you must think your sentence through and then say it, because otherwise that word that has been used so much becomes the narrative that it actually doesn't mean that word. And that's a very big concern. So, um, yeah, there's uh, there's no problems. Uh, we are doing a very um, uh, a, a good job with the media. We're doing some TV series for MNET now, and we will be doing a, a Bole Series 3 next year. Right. Yeah, well, that's uh, I think that's a great note to end the conversation on. Uh, uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time. This has been very fascinating. To our viewers, please like and share this video to spread uh, Mike's message. You've been watching Worldview.